Hello there and welcome back to another video here on Wrist Watch Revival. My name is Marshall. Thank you so much for coming along. This time on the bench, we've got, well, a dress watch from the early 1950s. This is a Gerard Perigo. If you've ever heard of that brand before, uh, if that rings a bell of any sort, it's because it still exists, actually. It is still a active watch brand, even though it started way back in 1791, became properly Gerard Perigo um, in 18, in the 1850s. But, uh, this watch, yeah, dates to the 1950s. And as you can see, it's in quite a shape here. It's a non runner. Um, it, it will not run. I got it off of eBay. It also, uh, is an automatic. And as you can see, the dial and crystal are pretty toast. It does. <laughs> okay. Well, I was going to say, it let me set the hands, which was nice, but then the crown just completely came out in my fingers trying to, uh, to readjust it back. So, yeah, that's not great news. Um, that's something that we're gonna have to inspect as well. So we've got a bit of a laundry list for this one. And for now, I'm just gonna leave the crown out and let's take a look at the movement and see what we're dealing with. This is uh, an automatic, even though it's a fairly early one. I mean, you know, 1950s. And as you can see, it's actually a nice looking movement. It's got a signed rotor. The rotor's the big part that spins on the top there. That's, that's what actually winds your watch up. Ooh, a little bit of decoration in there too. It does seem to be, okay, so this is good news. The balance wheel spins freely, and this is something that I'll always check early because it's very common to have the balance staff broken, and that's like the axle for that wheel, and if that gets broken, well, the watch isn't gonna run at all, but as you can see, it's actually running quite freely. Makes me wonder why the watch won't run if that's not the problem. Well, let's see if we can get the crown back in. Yeah, it does go in, and there's a screw that may have just gotten backed out that you need to tighten down that holds it in place. That's it right there. Okay, so now hand setting position, that works. And theoretically I can wind it, let's see. Yeah, it is winding, but it still doesn't wanna run. Now sometimes these things just need a service, right? Sometimes they need to be uh, taken apart in service. That's not uncommon for that to happen, but not really sure. Definitely some investigations to come. As we take out the crown again, we can try to get the movement out of the case. There's a movement ring here that kind of holds everything in place and keeps it from sliding around. So we'll take that out first. And then the movement should just come out. Oh, there it goes. Whoa, <laughs> okay. Wow, I, it was kind of hard to see through that scratched up crystal, but the dial is either very dirty or just what is that? As you can see, the hands are heavily corroded and the dial itself looks like it might also be, we can probably take a look at that in a little bit and try to see if that's dirt that we could take off or if it's more, uh, you know, paint or whatever the dial material is made of actually just missing. You can see some of the loom is missing on the hands as well. It's also completely deteriorated, so that's not great. Let's get the hour hand off of here. That dial looks actually kind of cool. It it reminds me of like a like reverse sky, like like stars, you know, in the sky, that kind of vibe. Okay, so let's take the dial off and see how it looks inside. Yeah, everything's looking good on the movement front. I'm actually a little surprised that it won't run at all. <clears throat> Makes me a little bit nervous. Cause like I put a wind in it, the rotor was spinning freely. The mainspring could be broken. That could be why it's not winding or holding a wind. Got this little box for the dial. We'll put that away. And while we're on this side, and by the way, when you talk about the movement, most of the time you'll refer to it as the dial side or the movement side. This is the dial side for, for obvious reasons, but I'll usually try to take off the cannon pinion while I'm on this side of it. The reason for that is it's attached to the center wheel. So when we flip the movement over and start disassembling the movement side, I'll wanna be able to remove the center wheel as well. And it looks like a little bit of these um, keyless works plus motion works, which is the motion works is what we call the part that actually moves the hands of the watch itself. 
is in the way. So I'm gonna get those out of the way and now I can use my Canon Pinion Removal Tool to take off the Canon Pinion. I'm gonna be very careful with these hands and put them in a box as well. I'll talk about those in a little bit, but there is a chance that these hands are radium and radium is a highly toxic substance that they used to use to make watches and other things glow in the dark. And it has to be handled with extreme care even now, as it can still be a dangerous substance. So I'm gonna put it in the box and set it aside. Now we're back on the movement side, and what we can do is start taking apart the movement from the top down. And what that means is, first there's a module, I guess is a good way to put it. It's called the automatic winding works. And that it consists of that big rotor that spins around when you move your arm, and then the gears and wheels that transfer that movement into winding on the watch. And it's a separate module. Like we can take it off here just like that. And it's kind of interesting because underneath is just a normal watch movement. In fact, you could even, I don't really know why you'd wanna do this, but you could take that automatic part and just never put it back on and you would just have to wind the watch every day like a manual wind watch. But the convenience of an automatic movement is really great. Basically what it does is, as you walk around through the day, you're typing on your computer, you're waving at your neighbor, it spins around in the watch. That's just from your hand moving and gravity affecting that rotor. But the ingenious part is that it takes the spinning of that rotor and it transfers it into a winding motion on the mainspring. That's the exact same thing you do when you turn the crown to wind it up. It's, it's really crazy that they were able to figure that out. All right, so getting into the disassembly here, we can start by taking off the train wheel bridge. And it looks like the train of wheels are kind of stuck. So I'm actually going to have to take off the uh, barrel bridge here as well. Most of these um, Swiss movements have two main bridges on the top. They've got the one that holds down the train wheels and then the one that holds down the barrel plus some number of train wheels. And usually you can take one off and not the other, but this movement looks like it's, it's asking me, <laughs> if you will, uh, to take off both so that I can take out the train wheels. So let's do that. We can take off the, uh, the ratchet wheel here and we'll take out the click as well. And now it looks like the barrel bridge is ready to come off. And I'm hoping that that will free up the train of wheels so that I can continue the disassembly on that side as well. You can see they kind of designed the bridge to go around the wheels with those cutout curves. Yeah, this looks like it's all in good shape as well. And now I should have access to the train of wheels, so I don't have to try to, you know, jam them out of there too badly. There's the the center seconds wheel. And now it looks like there's another bridge underneath here. So we've got some layering of, whoa, well, that's not right. Huh. Okay, well, I took out the the barrel, the mainspring barrel, and the lid just came off. In other words, it wasn't snapped down into place. And we'll have to investigate that in a minute. But in the meantime, we can continue disassembling this extra little bridge. This one sits across and sits on top of the center wheel. This is actually a pretty advanced movement for the age. This movement was made between 1950 and 1954. So, you know, there's a lot of technology in this. This is actually quite a nice watch um, for its day. It has a center seconds hand, it has shock protection, and it's even got some, some decoration on the movement as well. So this would be a pretty high-end piece for its day. I always like to try to imagine who owned these watches did they wear them every day for work? Was this a special occasion watch? Was this a gift for a special occasion? It's, it's one of the fun parts about working on things like this is you kind of get a little sense that you're bringing back a little piece of history. And I don't mean like in the Smithsonian or something. I just mean personal stuff, you know? This could have been somebody's watch that they wore every single day. Ooh, what is that? Okay, well, there's a big fiber piece of 
what is that? I, there's something that got loose in the in the movement there too. And that's also, also something that could be pretty bad. Okay, now I gotta be really careful with this. This is the yoke spring, there we go. I always use something else to stabilize it rather than just using the tweezers because tell you what, those things are born to fly. If springs could get tattoos, that one would have born to fly on its shoulder. So take a look at this. This is a decoration that I was talking about. This is called perlage, and this is done with a machine that pushes a circular kind of a sander, if you will, and you do that by hand. You actually space out those circles by hand, and it's beautiful. Okay, so taking a look, and it looks like maybe the arbor might have been unseated. That could cause multiple issues with the watch. It could certainly explain why the lid was off, and it could also potentially explain why we couldn't wind it, or like if it wouldn't keep a wind, if that's what the problem was. So when we put that back together, we'll make sure that it's all seated correctly, and then we'll, we can double check that. Okay, now, since this is an automatic watch, we have to take apart the automatic winding works too. And you know, this is kind of like another little mini watch, right? Like there's four, another little train of wheels here and a little bridge to take it off. These will all have to be cleaned, lubricated as well to keep the performance up as high as we can on a watch like this. One of the great things about doing work like this is how different it is from the type of work that so many of us do now, which is more like computer-based stuff, which I'm no exception, I do the same thing. And I actually love it. I, I love working on computers, I love computers, but there is something different about doing what we're doing here. Like, look at this, the whole entire thing has been taken apart, every little part. And then we're gonna put this in a three-stage cleaning solution and then get them sparkling and perfectly clean and then reassemble and re-lubricate it. And you just don't do that with very many things these days. It has a really nice feel to it. You get a real sense of satisfaction when you're done. Okay, so that's gonna be ready for the watch cleaning machine. Let's take a quick look at this case and see if we're gonna do anything to it. These are, to me, always the kind of borderline cases. We'll take the crystal out for starters because it looks like it's in really bad shape. <laughs> Yeah, okay, this crystal's done. Uh, it just snapped in half in my fingers under almost no pressure, but that's fine. We're gonna replace that. And now we can take out these lugs. You can also learn kind of a lot about a watch by the lugs. Look how old those are. So super crusty old lugs. But otherwise the case looks fine. Here's the case back. It has a, a bit of a used up kind of worn seal around it. So we're gonna need to replace that two at some point. And we'll just take that off for now though. That just helps it seat better. And of course gives it a little bit of, of waterproofness, if you will. Um, can try to clean up some of the dirt and grime that accumulates there. These pieces will be put into a, uh, into one of those, an ultrasonic cleaner, and that'll clean it up and we'll get a look at the case at that point. The bottom line is we have to make a decision on whether we're going to polish a case like this or not. I lean towards not doing so if it just has like a nice worn vibe to it. And that's where I'm leaning with this, but I won't know for sure until we're done with ultrasonic cleaning because that kind of shows you what you got. Ultrasonic cleaner is a really useful tool around the house. You can also clean a whole bunch of other things in it, not just watch parts. <laughs> and now we'll go ahead and put the watch through the motions here on the watch cleaning machine. This is a vintage machine that um, I picked up. It had been refurbished. I had to find a few extra parts for it, but it has been really good to me. And uh, it does a great job cleaning the parts. While the parts are cleaning, I did want to mention also, I've got a Patreon for this channel. It's uh, patreon.com slash wristwatch revival. And if you like what I'm doing here and you'd like to support the channel, that's the place to do it. It's really easy to get set up and you can set everything yourself. You can pick the amount, you can pick how often, you can come back, you can leave, you can come back. It's very flexible. And I really like the setup that they have on Patreon. If you do sign up, you get a thank you card and a sticker in the mail to, for whatever level you're at. And if you go up a little bit higher, you'll get to see the videos in their less edited form, shall we say. And uh, I just wanted to say big thanks to everybody who supports me on the Patreon. It does mean the world to me. 
Okay, so finishing up the cleaning here, you can see that out of the main initial cleaning solution, we have to do a rinse. So what I'm doing is I'm turning up the motor so that enough of the cleaning solution comes out and rinses off so that I'm not just dousing it because the next two steps are actually not proper cleaning solutions. They're actually considered rinses where now the machine will go through a whole cycle and then a whole nother cycle after that of being rinsed off. And you can see that now I'm just getting the last of the rinse off of the second rinse cycle here. <clears throat> and then this last stage that just looks like a hole there, it's actually a heater. There's a heating element below it and you turn on the basket really slowly and it will spin in there and it will dry off so that all the parts are perfectly dry when you take them out. And that's it, that's the whole cycle. It These machines, you can do this type of cleaning in an ultrasonic like I have here. In fact, for about a year when I first started doing watchmaking, that's how I did all my movement cleaning and it works really well. It's just very clunky, very time consuming. One thing that you have to note too is that the basket's very warm <laughs> being in, next to the heating element, so you have to give it some time. So there's the movement all laid out and looking beautiful, sparkling clean out of the watch cleaning machine, plus the case is all cleaned up. So what that means is we can now start the reassembly and see what we've got on our hands here. First, we're gonna put the mainspring back into the barrel. That means I need to use my mainspring winders. This is a specialty tool used just to safely uh, put mainsprings back into the barrel without bending or distorting them. You can do this by hand, but it's almost impossible to do so without bending them up pretty bad. So if you're gonna be working on a lot of movements, you're gonna to wanna to pick one of these things up. If you're doing it as a hobby though, you can just put it back in by hand. It, these these mainspring winders are very expensive and you know, you kind of take in the next step when you buy them. Fortunately for you and for me, I've taken that step quite a long time ago. <laughs> I've spent a lot more collecting my tools over the few years that I've been doing this. That is also one of my favorite parts about it. There's the mainspring back in the winder and now the best part. There we go, beautiful mainspring right back in the barrel. And now I'm gonna make sure that I get this, um, this arbor in correctly and that it fits. There we go, that's what we wanna see, nicely seated. I'm gonna use a little bit of medium viscosity oil on the top here because it does interact with the lid. And then I'm gonna use a small plastic tool to help me make sure that the lid is properly secured because that did bother me that the lid wasn't on when I took the movement apart and it could have been part of the issue as to why the watch wasn't running. So let's put this on here and then the top of this is actually shaped so that it will push down and seal the lid completely on top. Let's see if it worked. Yeah, it did. Okay, so that's what we wanted to see to make sure that that barrel's looking good as that could have been one of our problems. And by the way, look at that main plate. Doesn't that thing turn out beautiful? That perlage that they did is just gorgeous. Okay, so we'll start things off by doing the train of wheels once again. And uh, as we, if you recall, <clears throat> there's a few of these that have kind of a smaller bridge that goes over the top. That's this thing right here. And I'll go ahead and put the escape wheel in as well. And a little bit of oil on that jewel. And then we can secure this bridge. And that means that we can put the rest of the train of wheels on and then put the train wheel bridge on. Yeah, right now my thinking is that uh, it must have been that barrel that had popped out and that's what was stopping the movement. It's the only thing I've got. Okay, now we can put this bridge back on. This is a very tricky operation. All three of those jewels on the top that you see, the pivots from the wheels below them have to be seated in those jewel holes or else you cannot tighten down the bridge. Very gentle. Nope, no, nope, that's not working. Okay, a few of them, but it looks like the escape wheel doesn't wanna sit. I'm just gonna restart here. That that just didn't feel right. It didn't feel like uh, 
I could get all three of the wheels seated correctly. So we'll try again. Okay, very gentle. Whoop. That's too far. Okay, okay. Now again, I'm gonna use kind of a helper stick here and that's gonna help me just keep a little bit of downward pressure so that if I can get them aligned, they'll, they'll go into place and fit into the jewel holes. Close, but still doesn't, why doesn't this wanna get seated properly? Let's take a look at the, oh, okay. Well, I can see the problem. So take a look at the very end of that. There's supposed to be a pivot like that off of the front of the escape wheel. And it seems that it has broken off. So this is a new wheel that I had to order. And the with the pivot gone, well, that would explain a lot about why the watch isn't running. So let's try again. We'll go back to the assembly process with our new escape wheel. And we'll give this another shot because a broken escape wheel pivot will stop the watch cold. And that could have definitely been the reason why the watch didn't run. So here's the new escape wheel with the actual pivot on it. <laughs> and we'll try to get this back together and running. So same process as before, just carefully putting these wheels into place so that we can once again try the, the train wheel bridge on top. Sometimes this is how it goes with a hobby like this. You have to show a lot of patience and do the same operation multiple times. It can be, can test your patience for sure. Okay, we'll just put the, uh, the barrel bridge in place here temporarily. And then I'll try for the, for the train wheel bridge as well. Okay, here we go. It's gonna work this time. Making sure everything's lined up, very careful. Careful. Okay, it doesn't, hasn't seated quite yet. I'm using the tweezers to gently manipulate each of the wheels below and then what the heck? So I have them seated, but the thing will not turn. When I turn the barrel, all of the train of wheels should spin freely. I do not know what's going on here. So I'm once again, going to take this apart. Now this time though, I am going to put back the train wheel bridge with just the escape wheel on it like this. And let's take a look on the microscope and see what it's doing. Okay, there's the escape wheel. You can see it seated correctly. And look at that, it will not spin. Yeah, there's something going on with this jewel setup or something because it has no end shake. It means it can't move up and down at all. So that jewel right there, you can see the pivot in it, that is down too far. So that whole jewel needs to be moved up. Those are just friction fit, they're just pressed in. So we can actually do that. I have a tool here called a Horia tool, a jeweling tool, that will allow me to adjust the height of that jewel in the movement. This is not something I have much experience with though, so let's see if we can get it. <laughs> so I'm gonna take out, the way that this tool works is there's a, a plate at the bottom, if you will, it's called a stump, and then at the top, there's a pusher. And the pusher is what actually actuates on the jewel. So that's the stump that will go in and we'll set whatever plate we wanna work on. I can either move the bottom jewel down or the top jewel up. And here I'm just testing to make sure that the pusher actually fits and it does. Pusher is really cool. It has a little spring loaded spike in it that goes, that centers itself on the jewel hole. And then the rest of the pusher will actually be the thing that moves the jewel up and down. So what we need to do is now put the stump on and then we're gonna take the whole plate and line up just that one jewel, and then I'm gonna move it a few fractions of a millimeter further down. So do you see where it lines up right there? And now I can get it set, and then what I'm gonna do is move this top part, you can see there's some markings on it, just like three notches over 
hundredths of a millimeter. And now we can put it together once again and see if this actually works. And I'm gonna do it like before and let's see. Okay, that looks better already. There's a little bit of end shake. Let's see if I apply a blower to it, if it'll spin. Oh, it does. Fantastic. Oh, that's great. So now the wheel can actually spin because it has enough end shake to properly run. Okay, well, that is great. I It feels really good to use something that, I mean, I, I learned that quite a while ago and it hasn't come up for me super often, but you know, your troubleshooting brain kicks in and you start thinking about, okay, well, it could be this, could be that. And then even to have the tools to fix it is really great. It's a great feeling. One of the cool things about working on stuff like this for sure. So now that we've got that done, I'm hoping this thing will actually run <laughs> because once again, I have to go through this same process again. This is what the third or fourth time that we've done this, this initial stage of the reassembly, but it is what it is, right? Uh, again, this is part of the deal. When you buy a vintage watch off of eBay or wherever you get it, you know, especially for a non-runner, you tend to get a very good deal on it, you know, compared to buying one that would be fully serviced and running. And this is why, because, you know, you have to go through a whole bunch. I mean, I had to buy an extra escape wheel too. Also makes me wonder if the escape wheel was actually fine before and if it got broken when I tightened down the top, when I got them all lined up because that jewel was too far down. That could have happened too. I, I didn't notice that at the time, but that could have definitely happened. But luckily I was able to find another one. I did have to buy actually a donor movement just to get this one wheel. That's another thing that they don't tell you <laughs> is that sometimes you have to spend quite a bit just to get a, a single part. But hopefully it'll all be worth it if we can get this thing running once again. Come on, baby, let's go. What, what we wanna be able to do here is get this bridge into place and then turn the barrel and have all the train of wheels spin. That is our end game. Okay, it looks like, okay, let's try it. Yes, there we go. Ah, oh, that feels so good. It's not even running yet and that already feels good because that was not happening before. And it was one or the other a combination probably of the two issues, but that uh, that end shake issue probably caused from a shock, a shock meaning a, a drop or a fall or a bump to the watch. That could have also broken the escape wheel, though I'm not 100% sure if it was broken before or not. Okay, now we can put on the click after putting on the click spring. This is a fairly straightforward movement overall. The only real wrinkle that it has from being just a pure, we call it a time only movement, you know, no date or chronograph or anything else on it is that it does have a center seconds hand, but I mean, those are so common now. That's hardly considered even anything special. At the time it would have been a little more, just given how old this watch happens to be. Okay, so now we can get the barrel all buttoned up. And we can flip the watch over and start working on the dial side. First thing we'll do is put on the cannon pinion again. And now we can get the keyless works going. Keyless works ends up being a part of the watch that requires kind of the heavy duty lubrication, the grease rather than an oil. It's, you know, the difference being that the grease is, is in less of a liquid form. It kind of stays where it goes. And that's what that blue stuff is that I'm applying. These parts are meant to be metal rubbing against metal. They don't do that the entire time that your watch is running. So that's how they can get away with it. Just while you're like winding a crown or doing things like that but uh, they require this lubricant for that reason. You know, many of the friction points on a watch are steel up against ruby, 
like which is a form of sapphire. And you know, that's what all the jewels are made of. So that has a much different setup. You do use lubrication there as well. But when we're talking about metal on metal, that's where you can get wear pretty quickly, even metal shavings and stuff. So the lubrication is really important for that. And that's why I'm using some on these posts here as well. This is the medium. Anytime you see the red stuff, that's kind of the medium oil. <laughs> Putting on the minute wheel here. And we can put on this little cover. <laughs> put it into place carefully. And we can just grab the screw so we can screw that down. Okay, fine. <laughs> I saw the, I saw that hair as well. I just knew there's some percentage of you that that would just drive absolutely bonkers to think that I was going to uh, pin that down with that hair in there. So I waited a little bit. I got gotcha. you. I'm sorry. I, I thought it would be funny. <laughs> anyway, I did take that out and now uh, we can, we can continue on. We can put the uh, setting lever back into place, but we can't really screw that down until we get the winding stem in. So once again, some of the blue grease for the winding stem, again, is fairly heavy duty part. And once we get that in place, then I can screw down the, the setting lever, which I've done here. Little bit of lubricant and I can go for the yoke now. And just make sure that it's seated properly before I attempt to put in the, uh, the flying yoke spring. So once again, gonna be very careful using a stick here to help stabilize the spring in case it wants to jump. And that way I uh, don't see it go flying. Yeah, like right there, it probably just would have jumped if I didn't have that black stick there. And I'm trying to, there we go, bend this down. As you can see, it applies actually a heck of a lot of force to that yoke. I need to make sure that the yoke is properly seated on the sliding clutch before I let go or else that spring could still fly. And even then you kind of hold your breath because <laughs> that spring isn't being held down by anything until this setting lever gets put into place. And that's what kind of secures everything down as well. All right, there we go. So that's all in place now. And we can give it a tighten down just to make sure that everything's seated properly. And we can even give it a quick test. There we go, that looks right. And once you see that, the motion is correct and everything's clicking over. More lubrication is needed here. Again, for the same reason as before, this is a metal on metal connection and you wanna make sure this is not the place to skimp on the oil. Okay, flipping the movement back over, we're getting real close to the moment of truth here. This is now the pallet fork going on, which is the second to last part that we put in before we get to see if this watch will actually run again. And I'm really hoping it does <laughs> because having found those issues, those should have been what stopped the watch. And if it isn't, I have no idea where to start looking next because everything seems fine on this thing. So let's just cross our fingers and hope it works this time instead. I can put a little bit of a wine after putting in the pallet for it to make sure that it's being held under tension. And there it is. You can see it click back and forth under that tension. Whew. All right, here we go. This is the balance. And let's see if this watch will run. Who knows the last time it actually ran? Okay, gently, gently. Come on. Come on. Nothing yet? A little? Oh, there's something. Make sure this is seated. Oh, and there it goes. 
And there it goes. Beautiful. Now the movement's running again. And we really did it. We found the problems. And we got this movement running again. God, that feels so good to see that. I don't care how many times I fix one of these watches. Getting that movement running again is such a great feeling. Look at that. You'll have to indulge me just for a minute here. I, I just love looking at it. So beautiful. Oh man. All right. Back to business though, because yeah, celebration time's over. We still got work to do on this thing. First, let's oil up the jewels. So I'm going to go to the microscope here and put just a little tiny bit of oil in each of these jewels to make sure that they're running properly. And now we can do the cap jewels as well. These are held on by a shock setting. That's that brass, funny shaped brass thing on the top. That's actually a spring. I know it kind of doesn't look like one, but it is. And that holds on two pieces, that, which is the cap jewel, and then the jewel setting, which we'll go back for now. And there, there it is, it comes out. And these are gonna to need to be completely cleaned with a solvent and then re-lubricated and reinstalled. So this is a solvent, it's actually a solution called One Dip. It's a, you know, it's a solvent. It dissolves oils and dirts that might be present on both of these parts. So they're gonna go in there and I'll let them sit in there for a few minutes and swish them around. And once they've been in there for a little bit, we can take them back out. I put them on a piece of paper here, just a post note in this case, so that uh, they can dry. Now the solvent evaporates quite quickly. That's why we keep it in these little bottles because you have to be able to put the lid back on or it'll just be gone. But as you can see, it dissolves quite quickly. And one thing that does happen a lot on these old watches is that there'll be an oil buildup of kind of grime on the top that doesn't dissolve nicely. And so I'll use a piece of peg wood to take care of that and then just give it a quick dip once again into the solvent to make sure that there's nothing else you want perfectly clean for this part because we're gonna set some oil on it now and it has to sit perfectly in place and you don't want anything contaminating it. Perfect. And now I can use capillary action to simply set the setting back on and it'll just kind of suck that jewel on. Just like that. And now this is ready to be reinstalled back in the movement. Oh, missed a little bit, but that's not a big deal. The top pivot there from the balance, of course, has to go into the jewel. And what this will do is it'll suspend that drop of oil right where that really heavy workload is and let this watch run for years smoothly and cleanly with no uh, dirt or anything to inhibit it. Last, we just need to button this thing up by putting the shock setting back into place. And that kind of holds everything down. There we go. Now we can flip the watch over and uh, oil the jewels on the bottom part of the movement. And once again, we'll go through the same process for the bottom. This is the balance jewel bottom part. Of course, there needs to be in a top and a bottom to each of these. And as you can see, it's the same setup. So I'll just kind of cruise through this, take off the top and now take off the other setting. And uh, there they are. So, we can throw these once again into the one dip and it's the same process for the top as it is for the bottom. So we'll grab those, clean them up, get a little bit of oil on there. And once again, there we go. Reinstall back into the watch. And that's gonna let that balance swing beautifully from now on. Most of the time, uh, people will recommend servicing your watch once every five or six years. I don't actually think that that's necessary. I think that's a little sooner than you need to. I would say more like seven to eight. Let's see how it does on the time grapher after a little bit of adjustment. All right, good amplitude up to 260. Beat error is perfect. And it's keeping, looks like two seconds, three seconds, two seconds, four seconds, maybe six seconds. So pretty dang good on a daily rate there as well. So I am happy with where that movement's at. In fact, I'm not gonna lie. I'm thrilled with where that movement's at considering it wasn't running at all before. And uh, now we can continue with the reassembly. Of course, since this is an automatic watch, we need to put the uh, 
automatic winding works back on. I also cleaned and lubricated that reversing wheel, the one I'm putting in there as well. That takes a special kind of um, lubrication. It's kind of a, it kind of does both. It cleans and lubricates because you can't take it apart. But uh, it's all ready to go. And now we can put this cover plate on that has little pivots for each of those four wheels. And there we go. I can screw this down now. And yes, I will need to use a little, little bit of lubricant on these as well. These are just pivots. They don't see quite as heavy wear as the, the ones in the watch itself, but definitely worth just taking a second here to lubricate the jewels, make sure that they can spin freely. Now we can go ahead and replace that dirty broken crystal. In fact, snapped in half crystal as it turns out. And I think this watch is going to benefit a lot from that. And this is called a rober press. It, uh, it presses down on the outside of the crystal to kind of bend it inwards so that you can fit it into the lip of the case. And then you unscrew the top to let the crystal actually seat itself. Just like that. And now we've got a nice new crystal. It doesn't come out and that's all set to go. Now we got to talk about these hands. So I'm pretty sure that these are radium for the time frame and the way that they look, how they're really dark. It would make sense if they were radium. And I don't like to work on radium if I can help it. It is highly toxic. And I did get an extra set of hands that came with the donor movement that I ordered to get the escape wheel. And I think I really like them and I'm gonna give them a shot on the dial instead. Taking a look at the dial, I don't know what's going on with that. I think it looks really cool. I know that some people don't like it. Some people do the patinaed look. I think this one's like right on the border, but I do think it looks pretty cool. But I can't tell if that's something that I could actually clean up these spots or not. So let's put it on the microscope real quick and we'll see if, these, if this is corrosion or dirt. And it looks like it's corrosion. Yeah, th these are, that is not something that's gonna be removed in any way. And as such, I'm not gonna touch the dang thing. You know, you it, it gets it's tempting to jump in there and think that you can clean something like that up, but my guess is that you can't. So what I'm gonna hope is that the dial looks really cool and has a lot of character underneath a brand new crystal. And, uh, you know, for somebody who's really into that kind of, patina look, they might dig it. Like I said, it kind of has the night sky thing in reverse going. It's, it's a cool pattern that's on it, but the dial is definitely worn. All right, we'll reinstall the dial now and let's give these hands a shot and see how they look. They'll fit the movement because they're made for the movement. And the question is just, do they go well with the dial and the kind of style of the watch? Because these were from a different one. And so far, actually, I kind of like them a lot. There, you can see that those hands also have a lot of wear on them. They're clearly old and have seen a lot in their day. And that, well, that suits the watch. If I put brand new watch hands on this, it would look absurd, you know, given the rest of the watch's appearance. Okay, seconds hand can go on as well. And I think I actually kind of like these hands. Yeah, those look good. I'm gonna stick with those for now. I think that I'm gonna skip the whole radium thing and uh, and I'm gonna do this. I have worked on hands with radium. I, I will do it when needed, but I just happen to have this extra set from that donor movement and I figured, you know what? I kinda like them anyway and let's just not take the risk. Okay, put the movement ring in and now the crown. And we are in the home stretch for this little Gerard Perigo dress watch from the 50s. Last but not least, we need to put on the automatic winding bridge again. <laughs> again, it's kind of like a module. It has all the stuff attached to it and it just connects to the movement and uh, lets you do the automatic winding. So we'll screw that down and then just give it a quick test to make sure that it's working in both directions and it looks like it is, so that's great. That means that the watch will be wound up when you wear it, no matter which way it goes. And now we can put the case back on. A little bit of a shame to have to cover up such a beautiful movement. But this is how they made them back then. And take a look at that. Beautiful. Yes, that dial does really show well through the brand new crystal. And again, 
it's going to depend on your preference. If you kind of dig the whole <laughs> patina, you know, unique pattern thing, or if you're like, Hey, that just looks kind of old and used up. That's a, you know, everybody has their different view. I happen to like that look. I think it looks really cool. You can tell this watch has seen some days and I like that. And there it is a really nice Gerard Perigo gyromatic automatic dress watch from the 1950s brought back to life right here on the channel. You and me, we did it again. Thank you so much for hanging out with me for this restoration. It was really fun to troubleshoot and I'm really happy with the end product. If you want to catch up with me on social media, by the way, I am on Instagram for this channel. I'll post pictures of like watches from my collection or um, some in-between project update stuff like that. If you're over there and you want to check it out, it's wristwatch underscore revival on Instagram. That is going to do it for this video. I just wanted to say thank you so much again for hanging out. We'll see you next time.